Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. My new book, Diary of a Psychosis, is out. It's the most lively, devastating baseball bat to the throat takedown of what the public health establishment did in 2020 and beyond that you can imagine. It's my first book in nine years, and you're going to love it. Check it out at diaryofcovid.com. And if you've already bought it, make sure also to visit diaryofcovid.com so you can claim your free bonuses, including my free companion volume, Collateral Damage, a collection of stories from real people who suffered under the restrictions. They weren't allowed to tell their stories at the time, but every one of them told me, we just want to be heard. Check it all out at diaryofcovid.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here, episode 2469. Delighted to be joined once again by our old friend, Kevin Dolan, whom I got to know with his exit group. It's just called Exit. Um, what's, what, what's the website for that again? Exitgroup.us. Exitgroup.us. I got to know Kevin because of that. Uh, Kevin has a fascinating story. You can go back in the archives of the Tom Woods show and, and hear it. But here's a guy who, like all intelligent people, has dissident opinions and was doxxed, but at that moment decided to rethink everything. And he now runs Exit Group, which helps people, not necessarily j- just people who have been doxxed and had their careers ruined or whatever, because that is fairly rare, but he does help guide people who do feel like they're in a soul-sucking uh, job that they maybe they took when they were younger because they had to support their families. They didn't know what else to do. And it seemed like the best option. And now it's killing them inside and he helps guide them through. But it's, it's more than even that. I mean, a- Exit is, is a really, really valuable and important organization. So I then recruited Kevin for my School of Life program. I said, I want my School of Life people who, by the way, belong to the, the best community on earth, TomSchoolOfLife.com, which is preposterously low priced for what is inside it. I want to add to that as an extra benefit, small groups like what Kevin has, where everybody brings their expertise to, to bear, uh, their knowledge, um, and everybody brings the problems that they're having. And other people can help solve them, can help make connections. I said, I want that. And so who's going to help me get that? If not old Kevin Dolan, who's been doing exactly that for quite some time. And Kevin on his exit podcast just had a an episode that I thought we needed to talk about here because it it has the rather ominous title, You Have One Year. (laughs) So Kevin, welcome back. Great to be here, Tom. Thanks. All right. Listen, now that that I'll tell you, that was the first episode of your podcast I've listened to. I'm sorry I I'm admitting that, but (laughs) It, it won't be the last. I'll say that. It will not be the last. Thank you. That title got my attention. And I, you know, I say that as a guy who's putting out three of these episodes a week, and I'm always desperate to come up. What is that title that I can come up with that'll make people click and listen? And what I want to tell people is, even when my titles stink, click and listen anyway. You know, the episode is always better than the title. Okay, it's never the other way around. It's never a clickbaity title, and then it's a boring episode. It's always great, no matter how crappy the title is. But this really was a striking title. So can we at least start off with, what did you mean by that particular title? Okay, so uh, lately on Twitter, one of, the, one of the memes has been, you know, you, you catch a, a, a journalist or a politician uh, saying something absurd and ridiculous and you post like a picture of Tr- Trump making a mean face and you say you have one year uh, because uh, you know it is you know Tr- Trump's gonna win and we're gonna take it all back and you're gonna get your <laughs> I see and, I see okay uh, and uh, I I thought you know I, I was thinking about sort of how I expect 2024 to actually go and I, I think whether Trump wins or loses what you know there's there's all kinds of variables people talk about, you know, what the dollar does, what the stock market does, but basically no matter what, uh, 2024 and 2025 are going to be really, really interesting and volatile and complicated and things you did before are not going to keep working. And so uh, I, I thought, you know, we, we kind of have one year too. And I wanted to, uh, 
to put that out there and, and get people thinking about sort of what what to do under those circumstances, uh, given the urgency of the situation, which I think a lot of people feel, but they have a certain they have a certain level of helplessness about, and so they yeah. don't take action. Yeah, because nobody knows exactly what we what we know is we have an extremely sick society, and nobody knows exactly what to do. Partly because everything that you might think to do seems insurmountably difficult and not guaranteed to succeed. Uh, you feel discouraged. You feel aimless. There's no, not like we, I, I don't want to on this show in particular say that we need quote leaders because leaders almost always fail you anyway uh, when you put too much confidence in them. But we are very scattered and disorganized. I mean, the other side has you know presidents of universities, presidents of countries, CEOs of corporations, of very, very big, high-profile people urging them on in the wrong direction. We haven't got any one particular person. I mean, there was a, there were hints at the very beginning that Jordan Peterson might have been that person because at least he he checked off a lot of boxes, right? He 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 had qualifications. He was articulate, uh, very intelligent, uh, not afraid of saying countercultural things. But so, but we lack that. And so the result is nobody quite knows what to do. And there are some people doing some things that I think will turn out to be very helpful in the long run. But I think we, we're feeling really scattered and discouraged. And how can you blame people for that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's, it's, it's also the fact that, and this is, this is sort of what I get into um, in the podcast, there's a, there's a uh, school of thought or uh, a, a, a sort of scene uh, called accelerationism, which is basically the idea that uh, the things are uh, things are going to move forward at an accelerating rate. Things are going to change at an accelerating rate, um, and you can't, you certainly can't go back, and you can't even hold still. And uh, the thing to do is to sort of respond to the changing conditions and lean into them, and. Uh, a lot of people have have viewed that as kind of a nihilistic or a, a a dark, you know, thing. Like just sort of nothing about sort of things getting worse is changeable or escapable. And I was I, I spent some time trying to kind of reframe that and say no, it's it's not that uh, it's not that things can't get better. It's that things can't go back. They can't go back to the way they were. Um, you, you can't reverse entropy. No, can, can I just, just, can I just get clarification on that? When you say things can't go back, uh, you hear the left saying a, a lot of times you can't turn back the clock. Mm -hmm. And what they mean by that is that once a, a, a left wing innovation has taken root, it's there forever. And so mm -hmm. if you want to reverse it, forget about it because the clock moves in one direction and then, right. And the Whig theory of history says that it we just progress onward and upward toward the left wing utopia. Now, the the Whig theory of history didn't necessarily mean that, but it did mean that it, history is not really zigzag. It really is kind of a line like this. Um, and 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 so I I know you're saying you can't just say well we'll just recreate the conditions of the 1950s just like that in 2024. And but, even if you could, in 10 years you'd have the 1960s because you'd precisely replicated the same conditions that produced Yes, the exactly. That's right. Yeah, there must have, I, I've said this for the longest time. There must have been something wrong with the 50s if they led to the 60s, right? Exactly. So there must have been something exactly. wrong. But, but, so, but, are, but you're, you're certainly not saying that no left-wing gain can ever be overturned. I think you're, you're kind of saying you can't just transplant with a time machine a whole society from X number of years ago and just, just start it all over again. Um, but yeah. surely we can overturn some of the craziness. Well, you can. I don't know how, but we can. Well, I, I don't know how either, but, but you can't, um, you can't, uh, it, it, what, how, how do I put it? We, you, the, the original uh, system of the 1950s was outcompeted and overcome by what came after. And so to say that you're going to just sort of revert to an earlier uh, save 
of the society. It's like, well, it's just going to get beaten again in the exact same way. And yeah. Plus, you're you're in this situation where you're you're not only um, existing or trying trying to instantiate this outdated uh, uh, system. And by outdated, I don't mean you know morally inferior or whatever, like the way the left means. I mean uh, outcompeted. It 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 was it was defeated. And 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 defeated for like very clear, understandable reasons. Um, if you try to instantiate that, not only are you are you uh, uh, you know trying to create an, an outmoded, a, 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 a defeated system, but you're also like trying to create it as a zoo, as like a nature preserve for your little past ideology, which takes tons of energy and resources. And so that's why I talk about like the Amish and the Hasids. And the extent to which they exist kind of at the sufferance of the society around them. And, and you know, because they're viewed as like not a threat or integrated into the system, they're not actually competing with yeah. the system. They are uh, 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 allowed to exist in their bubble for like contingent historical reasons. Yeah, right. So that's why sometimes you, you'll hear... Um, you know, the odd commentator cite the Amish as an example of people who have... Now, I, I find absolutely zero appeal in Amish societies. And so I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. But as an example of people who are basically allowed to just live the way they want, apart from the system, basically nobody bothers them. So, but the, the easy idea that we could just replicate that runs af afoul of the, the fact that these people are allowed to do what they're doing as you say, because they're at the fringes, um, not that many people are attracted to that. But if suddenly that should change, you would start getting MSNBC exposés of Amish communities and what Amish family like is like. And there would be emojis that you'd have to put on your social media indicating that you're against Amish conservatism or whatever. And, and, and it would be off to the races. You saw in 2016 and 2020 where there was some some whisperings of uh, the Amish maybe having being politically relevant in Pennsylvania, um, and maybe maybe moving the needle for Trump. And you also saw at the same time there was this little trickle, this little like shot across the bow of exposés about like a, a Amish family culture and patriarchy and you know, covering up sexual abuse and not talking to the police about it. And uh, it, it, I, in my mind, that was essentially the media saying, like, watch yourselves. Like, because we can come after you. We can come after your kids. And, and, and the only reason that we're not doing it is because you're politically irrelevant. And if you were to suddenly become politically relevant, that would be a really serious problem. And I actually think, you know, uh, uh, the 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 Amish uh, attitude of sovereignty around their family law, their sense that like we handle all that stuff and it's none of your business is a really strong, is a, it's a big vulnerability for them because the average uh, American, when they hear like, oh yeah, we, we, we handle domestic abuse cases and we don't report to the police. Uh, the average American is like totally cool with, state power being deployed against people like that. And it it if you want a if you want a compelling alternative to the existing system that that meaningfully competes with it, the, the primitivist thing just is not going to work. Folks, there are so many ways we can use our dead time and a lot of people just let it stay dead. But you, dear listener, want to bring that dead time alive. And the best way to do that is with the Blinkist app. With the Blinkist app, you can absorb huge amounts of information in 27 nonfiction categories. So we're talking history, philosophy, parenting, career, technology, religion, and on and on. Blinkist condenses thousands and thousands of nonfiction books into 15-minute summaries that you can read or listen to. So if you have a half-hour commute each way, you can be absorbing the equivalent of four books. You think that might make you a slightly more impressive person? And among the thousands and thousands of titles at Blinkist, you'll also find, as I've told you, libertarian classics. Even Murray Rothbard. I mean, a, a company that features Murray Rothbard. You know, you, you got to figure they're at least okay, right? Murray Rothbard, Milton Friedman you'll find there. 
You'll even find old Tom Woods. Well, right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Woods to start your seven-day free trial and get 40% off a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Woods to get 40% off and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash Woods. And now for a limited time, you can even use Blinkist Connect to share your premium account. You'll get two premium subscriptions for the price of one. Yeah, yeah. It, well, th- there's the, and I won't even discuss because I, it would take us too far afield. Um, but there is an anti civilization movement, very small, but that says that, yeah, the reason that your whole society is full of people with neuroses and three quarters of them are in therapy and four fifths of them are on drugs is that they're living unnaturally. We're not mm-hmm. meant to live like this. And mm-hmm. nature will ultimately have its revenge. And I, I feel like there's a lot to that, except the conclusions that they come to. I mean, I, I'm sorry, I can't believe that a, a society where I can't listen to Beethoven, you know, is superior to one in which I can. But, but that's, a, that's a separate matter. What, what I'm, before we go into other approaches to this problem that we face, I want to know if, the, if, in your opinion, you could, I mean, I feel like if you ever do achieve the kind of society you want, even then you can't like rest on your laurels because there's always a, these, these things are obviously unstable and you have to preserve what you've built. But my, I guess my question is, how can somebody like you or somebody like me, how can we ever win, uh, you know, for any length of time when it seems as if it's inevitable that any society we build will be put upon by the same kind of people who have wrecked every society. That is, that is to say, um, we, we being like conservative minded are not really thinking about bringing the, the, um, the blessings of natural rights all around the world. Okay. Now some people thought that's what conservatives favor, but that's because they're dumb. Uh, we, we care about what's closest to us. We understand that, our, our, our sentiments and our sympathies extend in a series of concentric circles. They don't start in Ukraine. They start here with your home. And if your home's a mess, but your, all your attention is on how bad Putin is, there's something wrong with you. Like mentally something wrong with you. So we have finite goals because also we have a view of, of human beings that they're not perfectible. They're not infinitely malleable. We're not going to engage in vast social experiments on them. It, we're happy if we can have a decent, livable society in, where we are. But we're always going to be up against the, the builders, the revolutionaries, the, the uh, well, builders of revolutionary societies, the destroyers generally, and, and people who uh, frankly don't care about these matters of hearth and home and, and, and the kinds of sentiments that, that you and I might have. And, and they're the kind of people who, when they see something like this, the, the, their every instinct says, destroy, 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 undermine and destroy. How, do, how can we ever win? Because we're not that way. We, we're busy working and raising families. We don't think that way. So are we always going to be defeated by people whose job it is to upend traditional societies? Well, there's a, there's a cycle to it, right? Uh, because that impulse to destroy uh, I mean, obviously, by by definition, can't hold itself together, and and so it's really it's a question of how bad does the pain have to get for the people who are temperamentally opposed to conflict, opposed to upheaval, opposed. Well, it's, yeah, it's just the um, the Declaration of Independence when a, when a long train of abuses, you know, it, that's. Uh, that's where the line is. And, and, and part of what I talk about in, in the episode is, is that the people uh, controlling the present system are vulnerable to entropy, in some ways more vulnerable to entropy uh, than we are. And in, in the exact same way, the world's changing on them too. And they're... Uh, their philosophy and their ideology is much is purpose built for our existing like managerial economic system. 
Whereas uh, what we have are uh, some 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 timeless principles. Hopefully, uh, like you know, hopefully conservative does not actually mean instantiating the 1950s. It means looking at the scope of human existence and looking at what works uh, on a on a on a historical scale and maybe even an eternal scale. And and so these disruptions, I actually think that we're at we're at a we're approaching a point where the disruptive character of our circumstances benefits people who uh, who take that long view as opposed to people who are just sort of like apex predators for this managerial system, which that's that's all uh, that's all progressivism is. It's people who have chased power in whatever direction it leads. So like like you know, a, a progressive in the 1920s or even in the 1980s would be horrified by, what a progressive in 2024 looks like. Uh, and it's because they're not actually, there's, there's no through line of ideology connecting them except just this naked pursuit of, of power through the dissolution of, of, of the culture, sort of uh, um, burning cultural capital as fuel, right? So let me give you an example. If, if uh, men and women are working together as families in a unit and, uh, you know, mom's income is not generating income tax. It's not generating, uh, you know, a lot of consumption on a corporate balance sheet. It's not generating a lot of labor hours that, you know, that can like depress sort of wages and, and, um, and benefit uh, corporate employers. Well, then there's all kinds of potential energy wrapped up in that system. It's almost like nuclear fission. Like, like if I can, bust apart that family and get them buying things that they used to make for themselves and getting them to commodify services they used to do for one another. Um, and particularly if I can start to, uh, instead of addressing the family as the fundamental political unit, I can start aggressively pursuing the one party's interests at the expense of the other and putting, pitting them against each other and generating a lot of political energy well, then I can seize a lot of power. And someone who uh, believes in the family as the fundamental political unit, they can't seize that power because they don't want that vision to happen, right? They, they, they believe in something and they want to hold it together. And so uh, the, the, the accelerationist or the, the sort of the frame of mind that I'm in uh, in the podcast is not that, uh, you know, the libs are going to win on the family. There's nothing you can do about it. What I am saying is we have, to, we have to take a new approach to how we safeguard and, 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 and bring those people. We have to actually bring those people back together. We have to uh, overcome that energy release and that dissipation. And, and one of the ways I think that happens uh, right now, um, and you know, I had, this, I had this natalism conference. It was essentially about uh, this and a few other questions. But like, instead of relying on uh, the, the, the legal and, and cultural traditions that held those families together historically, we have to figure out new ways of persuading people to come together in that way and, and making them safe. That doesn't mean, you know, a, a, a abolish marriage, or, or, but, but it does mean uh, that the, the political arguments used to, to get people uh, married and to defend marriage as policy that that can't just be like well we have to go back to the way it was that's not going to work. So, in your episode, you were talking about a number of ways that people have tried to tackle what should we be doing, mm -hmm. and so we've we've hit a couple of them. Um, I mean, there is the there is kind of like a prepper approach that we ought to just uh, and, and I, I I I mean I guess there's a there's a a spectrum of prepper approaches, isn't there? Because sure, yeah, you, you could imagine somebody who's a prepper and doesn't isn't actively involved in anything else other than protecting his own family from you know come what may. Sure, uh, but presumably there are other people who are doing that and are doing other things. Um, you know, your you, people in your exit group, I think, are are working with each other oftentimes on projects, and I think on the grounds that. Whatever it is I'm supposed to do, whatever whatever 
useful thing I can do to help create a livable society. Maybe I haven't figured out exactly what that is or how I fit into that, but there's no scenario in which my having more resources will be worse than if than, than the opposite. I mean, it, it, at the very yeah. least, I can work hard and earn a good income. And that means I can, first, I, I can command uh, more resources. I can get more done. I can help more people. At mm-hmm. the very least, I know that's probably a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's uh, so one of, going back to the sort of acceleration argument, it's like if if things are incredibly volatile and you don't it's 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 increasingly impossible to predict the future. You want you want things that are adaptive across a broad range of scenarios, not just one. And I I, I talk about how um, intelligence is a meta adaptation. Like intelligence doesn't just make you better in the savanna or in the jungle or in the tundra or in the mountains. It makes you more survivable everywhere across the board because you develop tools. And and this is. Uh, part of what generates that acceleration is that is that the, mo- the smarter we get and the more tools we develop, the faster we are able to change our environment, the faster we're able to disrupt our environment, which means more things to adapt to, which means, so it's an accelerating process, which is why there are so many uh, curves uh, in history, population, productivity, all kinds of things that have this like, this massive exponential uh, trend to them uh, that you know started with the industrial revolution and uh, so as far, as far as um, what we can do in our current situation like where you know uh, uh, 300 years ago if you were a farmer you knew that the stuff that you knew how to do was going to be really useful to your kids and um, everything you knew about where you lived that was all going to that was all going to translate and track and and that's part of why um, parents just had an easier time relating to and raising their kids and you know uh, starting in the 20th century and you know some of this is some of this is um, narrative put out by people who uh, who 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 mean us harm but I think there is some truth to the idea that like the circumstances in the 20th century really were changing so rapidly that uh, parents had less certain knowledge of sort of how their children should navigate the world. And it, more now than, is it safe to say more now than ever? A lot of times we, 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 we use hyperbole uh, unintentionally and we're always yeah. saying this is the worst this, the best that. But maybe this is uh, the most uncertain time because the, the, the rate of change is so great. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I don't even, like, when I, when I talk to, you know, I've been married for uh, uh, going, on, going on 15 years. And um, when I talk to guys just trying to date now, they're not, you know, they're not, like, you know, young enough to be my kids. But even just, like, the next generation back, I have no idea what to tell them about how to navigate this dating environment is so unbelievably uh, different from 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 what I experienced and and so you're looking for things that are uh, meta adaptive that 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 translate across all circumstances and yeah the, the my, my my problem with the prepper thing and I you know I have food storage I, I have ammo and you know I'm I'm interested in that uh, in principle but Prepping as like I have a particular future in mind, and I, you know, I'm going to prepare for this one singular future. I think uh, probably made sense when like the one big prepper thing was like either you know we can have an economic downturn or we can have like global thermonuclear war, and those are the situations in which I'm going to need to get my oats and beans and bullets out. Uh, you you really had one outcome to prepare for, and now. Uh, it's like, is it AI? Is it uh, civil war? Is it nuclear war with Russia? Is it nuclear war with China? Is it, you know, a, 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 the collapse of the dollar? You know, there's a million things, um, all of which have this like non trivial probability of happening. And if you, uh, if you get too married to one of those outcomes, the things that you would do in that situation are actually like, counterproductive in some cases in in some other situation and so uh i i I was thinking about like what are the things i would want in the broadest possible spectrum of situations and i came to 
I would want to be as uh, smart as I can be. I would want to be around people who are as smart as possible. And I would want to have as much liquid resources and mobility as I possibly could have. Um, and so, yeah, that, that means, uh, in, in particular, liquid resources that I have real access to. Uh, not that are not that are held by someone else or under someone else's control, uh, and so exit the the, the whole the whole uh, ethos of exit is about getting those kinds of of resources and getting more control over the resource flows that you have. So, like if you're in a if you're in a corporate job where uh, you don't have a lot of leverage in your in your uh, salary negotiations, or if they tell you you got to take a jab or whatever. Um, then, then one way to increase that control over that power flow, that uh, that uh, income stream, is to skill up in a way where your your skills are more uh, broadly uh, marketable, so that uh, when the time comes to have that negotiation, you can say, "No, I'll actually just I'll just go do something else. I'll go do something that I can do from a laptop, that I can do from uh, from Puerto Rico or Portugal." Uh, or that I can do for a whole different industry because it's it's, it's universally universally applicable, um, and so those are the kind of skills that I want the guys to develop, and those are the kinds of uh, jobs that I want them to look for. It's 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 entrepreneurship, obviously, uh, but 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 in the abstract, like wherever you're at, you can be more entrepreneurial in your approach. You can take more control. You can have a stronger negotiating position. And um, so that's the that's the uh, resources side of it, and then on the social capital side of it, it's like uh, my my like gold standard guy for my group. Like I've got these guys who are like, uh, yeah, I'm a I'm a I'm a green beret, and I broke necks in Afghanistan for a decade, and uh, I'm also like a VC or a crypto developer. Like I'm 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 super useful here and now. Uh, I'm always looking for guys who like have that dual uh, purpose quality where like no matter what happens, it's going to be a really good guy to know. Um, and so, yeah, it's, 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 it's social capital and it's physical capital and it's being in control of where that capital comes from and how, and how, you, uh, how you protect it. Hey, everybody, let's take a minute to thank our sponsor, Persist SEO. If you are getting buried by your competition online, then build your brand, your reputation, and your lead flow with digital marketing by Persist SEO. If you are a small local business trying to compete against large companies in the service industry, then increase your visibility with Persist SEO. Or what if you have low or no leads coming in on a consistent basis? Well, then website search engine and conversion optimization can help move the needle to a more prosperous business model for you. Are you tired of cold calling and networking, meeting places getting shut down? Use your website as a lead generation engine. Or what if you're not showing up for your services in the search engines? Well, get found with Persist SEO's expert search engine optimization. All you have to do is call 770-580-3736 or visit them at ineedseo.help for a free website audit and consultation. That's 770-580-3736 or I need SEO dot help. Um, I, I want to say one thing and then ask a question that you could easily talk for hours on. I'm going to ask you to talk about it for only one minute. That's okay. the real challenge, okay? So the, the, the thing we're going to say is, first of all, your exit group, which is exitgroup.us, can help people do exactly the things you've just said. Mm -hmm. um, the groups in my School of Life program, and we learn a lot of things in monthly webinars and stuff, but... But the key meat of the program is these small groups where people are making friends and they're working on things and they're making connections. Right. And, you know, like this, the, you know, as, as, as I've said, I love talking about theoretical questions and that's a lot of fun. But, you know, if now isn't the time to roll up your sleeves and do something, you know, I don't know what is. And I'll say parenthetically, in my school life program, I have a guy who is actually building a, um, ultimately a business school. Like that's how ambitious he is, a business school for normal people. And he is, and he's not just some schmo. I mean, he's got, he's got money, he's got experience, he's got connections. This is not some pie in the sky thing. So we have people doing that. 
that will help society at large, but we also have people just working on their own personal habits to, to help them be in a position to be successful. We have people doing that. But the point is that we're all doing something. We're all doing yes. something. So we're having, uh, I actually haven't asked, well, of course you're going to be there. You're speaking. But at our, our conference in June, this is an event where we're going to talk all practical things. What are things we can do, not, not just to survive the current craziness, but even to thrive in it? And we're going to talk about every topic under the sun because it's not going to be a series of lectures and you sit there and consume them. It's, it was your idea, Kevin, to do it as an unconference where we break up into different rooms on different topics and we lead discussions and people participate. And if you're an introvert and you hate the idea of participating, we're not going to like torture you into participating, but you can still sit there and absorb the material. So anyway, so, but now here's the question. Oh, that's tomwoods.com slash unconference. You should all be there. It is extreme. My school of life, people get it for free, but for everybody else it's very cheap, very cheap. I mean, this, this is a, this, this is a financial loss for me every year that I do this event. This is our third year. It financially, it's a total loss, but I, I know what I'm doing and, and I'm in a position to be able to put on an important event like this. And if people who are in a position to put on important events like this don't put them on, then no one's going to put them on. So I'm putting it on. So oh, your job is just to be there. My, my job is to write out the checks. You just have to be there. TomWoods.com slash unconference. Now, here's the thing I'm going to ask you to answer in one sentence. Oh boy. I beg your pardon. One minute. I'll be liberal. One minute. Okay, that's better. We were at our mastermind um, meeting in Las Vegas last month. TomWoods.com slash mastermind for all you people who want to become wealthy and successful higher than you are now. TomWoods.com slash mastermind. And you said something in one sentence that I thought was so profound. I said, I want you to give an entire talk on this at the unconference. So we are going to have a, a few formal talks the first night, and then it's anarchy. But you said simply this, the future is people you can trust. And I just stopped dead in my tracks. I said, that is the name of a talk. Now, do you agree with me? I mean, that was, I was perceptive there. That is the name of a talk. What did you mean by that? And, and what could we maybe expect from you on that? Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, it really is the, the, the power of your network, the power of the intelligent people that you can connect with and that you can help, you can be useful to. Um, a lot of times uh, w w what we're helping people do is to get themselves in a situation where they can be more useful uh, or, or, uh, or, or more um, accessible to somebody who's very, very smart. Like I'm helping guys get together pitch decks and that kind of thing. Um, to, to, to craft something that makes you uh, a, a value in that situation. But yeah, number one, it's, it's you want to be around competent people, you want to be around high integrity people, and you want to be around people of goodwill. And I mean, yeah, that's uh, you know, hanging around the, um, the school of life and, and, and working with those people. It's it's incredible the, the the group that you've put together, and uh, and yeah, I mean, in terms of the future that's ahead of us, uh, it's anybody who tells you like, oh, it's this one asset, or even this asset class, or or it's this one um, skill set, or it's this one, you know, entrepreneurial venture. Uh, they don't know what time it is. It's 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 broader than that. It's more volatile than that. Uh, it's very difficult to see what's ahead. But there's no situation in which having a group of very trustworthy, very competent, very capable people uh, is not going to help you. And you know, in particular, we we think we live in this society where now. Uh, we can no longer be naive the way we were even five years ago about like what your doctor tells you. Yeah. You know, I mean, I keep giving this example, Kevin, but about, you know, after I turned 50, I went in the doctor's office and they said, oh, you know, by the way, it's time for your shingles vaccine. And I, I'm so, you know, I'm sorry to say that I, in the past, I would said, okay, I mean, I, you know, what do I know? Of course, of course it's time for my, and, you know, maybe it is, I don't know. And then they're saying, you know, because it's 87% effective. And I thought, well, as soon as you start talking like that, is this the same percent effective that the, the you-know-what shots were 100% effective? Like, is this the same yeah. new math they're using? And so, you know, immediately I have to go home and look it up. And I was never that way before. And, and so it's, in a way, it's a good thing that I'm not as 
silly and naive about things like that, but it really goes to show that in terms of the future being people you can trust, it's in everything. I mean, it's absolutely in everything. Academia, you can't trust. There are entire academic departments centered around complete nonsense. And, it's and yet these of, people... I beg your pardon? Sorry, to say, to say nothing of the, the expansion of AI. I mean, it's, it's the, the fact that uh, any question that you would normally put to these sort of... Uh, these big, massively scaled institutions, uh, it sort of has an asterisk next to it. Um, you don't know if it's, if it's even coming from a real person. Um, and yeah, you don't know if sort of the institution that produced that information is corrupt. And so having, having uh, specifically, like, like uh, having a doctor who you know to, be, to have the credentials and to, to, to be smart enough to, to, to address these questions, but who's looking at them carefully in a way that you don't have the time or the inclination to do, um, that I think is how people are going to navigate the information environment in the future. It's not going to be, you know, let me go to the giant, massively scaled uh, institution anymore because uh, th those, uh, those information flows have become polluted. So you really need human beings and human judgment, and that's that's the future, right? And 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 I'll say, I mean, I I I don't mean. I was going to say I don't mean to plug my service, uh, but I do mean to plug my service. There's no shame in that. Um, right. One of the great things about the School Life program is that I'm curating. Uh, I'm finding people whom you can trust, well, whatever the topic is. So you can't trust people on money. You can't trust them on health. You can't trust them on you know, quote unquote, climate science, whatever, although climate science is not that practical. And like, I don't have to deal with that on a daily basis the way I have to with my money losing its value or my kids being brainwashed uh, if I sent them to certain schools and stuff like that. But I found the people who know the actual stuff and will teach you the actual things you need to know. Um, you know, and, and, and incidentally, my daughter Amy right now, uh, now Amy is very artistic and she could very easily have a, um, a career an artistic kind of career. And you usually you think artistic career, nobody makes any money in it. Amy would make money in it. But the thing is, I'm also teaching her how to run an online business because she's got to be able to pivot uh, on a moment's notice in a society like this. Where's she going to learn that? In in ordinary society? In a typical high school? Uh, wh where's she going to learn that? Uh, wh who's telling her that that's important? Nobody. But my people in my school of life, or me myself, because I teach this stuff to people, I, I'm the kind of person who can show your kid, you know, how you can have, so how, how all that screen time you're spending can actually be put to good use, learning how to do something that can make you a living someday. And if there's one, you know, I would rather see kids get addicted to making money than to playing video games. And I think I can accomplish that for them. Um, so, yeah, so what I've got in, in, in there are people who know what they're talking about in a whole lot of areas where we get nonsense or we get total silence in the rest of society. So give us one more time, though, the website for Exit, uh, Exit Group, because people should check you out. Thank you, exitgroup.us. Exitgroup.us, tomschoolofLife.com. We'll put these in the uh, video description and on the show notes page, show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 2469. Uh, probably next time I'll see you, Kevin will be... Um, well, actually, the, we're having the mastermind meeting just before the event, but I'll see you in June for all these uh, wonderful festivities. Well, thank you for, thanks for your insights. For, for now, you got me listening to a, a whole other podcast now. I appreciate that. I'm always looking for things to, to get my brain going and for your time today. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.